Thank you so much for listening to the Voice of Job Seekers. This is Mark, and uh, this podcast today, uh, for some of you who've been loyal listeners, and and actually many of you have been loyal listeners, and I do thank you for listening in for the whole season. Uh, this will be the end of the fall season uh, to be continued on January 10th. That'll be the new episode. And you're going to get a lot more uh, episodes than you had before. I plan to have some bonus episodes in the beginning of the year, or at least the winter part of the year. And um, got a couple of live presentations that I'll be presenting as well to you. Hopefully that will all help you in your job search. And to, you know, bust some of the myths that you hear and you read on the web, many times you will read advice from people who are, you know, who haven't really been in the job market for a long time, or they are misrepresenting uh, some of their uh, methods that they used. Uh, but mostly, I just want to be sure to introduce to you uh, the various ways you can find work and change careers and be productive in the workplace. Nevertheless, I want to present to you the last, as the last episode, the episode I did with Anthony Quinones, whose podcast, The Point of Q, uh, was able to interview me about my review of the job search and uh, my thoughts on how to find opportunities as well as maybe just a little bit of marriage advice I toss in there. That's only because, uh, you know, I think that, you know, you really should be, uh, you know, working with your spouse as much as you possibly can and helping you view yourself as uh, the best candidate possible. I think there's a lot of value in that, and you'll hear a little bit of that advice. And again, uh busting some myths and I think that people are um, looking for really great reliable solid answers in the in the job search and I think I provide some of that in the episode in the meantime it's about 35 minutes long uh, so this is Anthony Quinones uh, your point of cue podcast and you can find that in iTunes and I'll put a link in the show notes on the blog here I hope that you enjoyed the episode, and uh, Merry Christmas, since I won't be uh, publishing anything else as far as the podcast. Um, you know, if you want to get more tools, I'll be continuing to publish articles around the web and on the blog during my break, so uh, you don't feel like you have to miss out on anything. I'm still writing. And I'll still be publishing and be publishing on other places. And I'll share that as well. If you want to see what I'm doing uh, in its entirety, or at least the announcement, uh, find me on Twitter at Mark A. Dyson, of course. But you all have a great holiday. Here's the show. I hope you enjoy it. From the studios of Cubo Media in New York, you're listening to Your Point of Cue. This is a weekly lifestyle podcast that explores how people have taken risks to make their own breaks in their lives. And I'm your host, Anthony Quinones. And each week you'll hear me interview someone who has made their break and how you can do the same. So are you ready to make your break? Well, let's go. You're listening to Your Point of Cue, episode number four. And I'm excited to introduce to you my guest. My guest is the voice of job seekers. He's a career consultant, job seeker advocate, career writer, and founder of the award-winning blog and podcast, The Mention, The Voice of Job Seekers. He has published more than 400 articles on his blog and on some of the largest sites on the web, such as Recruiter.com, U-Turn, Business Insider, Lifehack, and The Muse. He has been quoted in major publications such as Monster, AOL Jobs, Fortune, Le uh, Levo League, Flex Jobs, Career Pivot, and Job Monkey listed his podcast as one of the top eight podcasts to help in your job search. So I introduce to you my guest today, Mark Anthony Dyson. 
Mark, welcome to your point of cue. Well, thanks. Uh, I appreciate being on. All right. And, uh, you know, a mutual friend, Mark Miller, um, said that his, that your, uh, podcast is the only one he listens to on this subject. So, uh, you are definitely in some great company there. Yeah. And I appreciate his shout out always. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. So you're a career consultant, job seeker, advocate, career writer. You're a career guy. So how did you get into the career business? Um, it was by accident, kind of. Um, um, while I was, um, I'd been doing a number of things, and I said I always wanted to start a business. And uh, my brother-in-law and my sister, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law suggested, hey, you should, uh, you know, write resume. So I eventually started a resume company, which I've dissolved since because I just kind of grew out of interest in the subject and in writing resumes all the time. Uh, but uh, before I did that, I created the Voice of Job Seekers, which was uh, something that resonated with me and uh, a few other folks. So um, that is the staying power right there is that particular voice that I uh, created. Mm-hmm. Now, were you working for a long time in corporate America before this? Yeah, I had worked uh, with two of the largest associations in the world. Uh, one was American Medical Association and the American Bar Association. And, mm. uh, you know, at, at the point that I stopped working there, it became too much. Uh, I was a floor manager and... Um, it just became uh, too much. It was a never-ending cycle of uh, solutions that became, uh, some of them were out of date, other things that just became too much to manage. And uh, so I eventually cried uncle now in crying. <laughs> uh, in crying uncle, I didn't tell my wife, who is still with me after all these years, but how about that? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's the one thing I never advise, and I, I wouldn't advise, is not to tell your spouse. Always talk with your spouse. But we were, it, she knew that it, I was coming to the end. And at the time that I had decided to, you know, cry uncle, um, the company liked me enough to keep me on eight weeks after I had, uh, you know, said that I was planning to resign. And hmm. uh, they, and another unusual um, move, they also said, you pick the date. <laughs> so, because, uh, you know, these days, you know, if you resign uh, many times, uh, they're either walking you out the door and they're rushing you out so they can get the next person in. Yep. I was... I was fortunate in, you know, being able to have that choice and for them to have enough respect for me, which was kind of surprising at the time because things weren't going well at all. But mm -hmm. it, but for some odd reason, they liked me. They just didn't like the results that I was producing at the time. So uh -huh. I was fortunate and really blessed to, to be able to uh, at least have some control uh, after that. So, uh Yeah. So, yeah, I did the corporate thing for a while. And, um, you know, after that, started my own business. And I did work some jobs here and there. I was even a substitute teacher, um, you know, uh, got a personal training certificate and did that for a short bit. But this career consulting thing kind of took over my interests and my income. So uh, mm -hmm. at that time that I was kind of at the crossroads. So, uh and I was trying to do all three at the same time. But, um, you know, I was, again, very blessed to be able to find it. And I'm not saying that there weren't some valleys in between that. Don't, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> don't want to make it sound like I had all the answers and everything was smooth. It definitely wasn't. But I was able to find my way here because, uh, um, you know, that was something that seemed to really work well for me that I love to do and that people like me doing. Yeah. And it's great that you mentioned that there were valleys along the way, because a lot of times people will present whatever they're switching to as being smooth and no problems. But usually there's a lot of growing pains that uh, go along with it. Well, there's, there's, there's always growing pains that go, go along with it. Even when I switched, uh, 
from my resume company to just solely being the voice of job seekers. There are still things that, you know, I need to work out to make it a smooth transition. But fortunately, there's a couple of things in place, such as your spouse working and, uh, you know, things like that. There are still layers of hustling that I, I have to do. It's a lot of hustle. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, it's the hustle that I love, and it's the it's the uh, challenge that I love. So uh, I can't complain. Yeah, and it's great that uh, you and your spouse have an understanding. And great advice uh, earlier: always talk to your spouse. So Mark is not just a career expert, but he's a marriage expert. Yeah. <laughs> I have anointed him as that. <laughs> um, but that is definitely <laughs> something that is. Uh, um, important, um, and also having a spouse, even if she's not deeply involved in what you're doing, it's good to have a, a spouse that supports you. Well, we're surprised. People would be surprised what wisdom their spouse has, mm-hmm. no matter what their background is. Sometimes even their spouse may even bow out of your business. I would say it's best for your marriage trajectory, having been married 25 years now. I can honestly say it's best to keep them apprised of your feelings, your your ventures, the things you're, you're doing to make your business happen. Because if you need to pivot at the last moment, it's better to have kept them updated and say, okay, I'm getting ready to do this, as opposed to having them to have to explain everything. And the explanation could be overwhelming. And they mm-hmm. may reject it because, based on how much information that may be perceived that you kept from them. When really yes. they may even have decided that I really don't need to know everything, so mm-hmm. uh, it's 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 better that way. Yeah, great point. Um, so now let's tri- uh, transition into the voice of job seekers. Okay. And so, as the name states, you are the voice, okay, of job seekers. How do you advocate and fight on behalf of the job seeker? Um. A lot of it is uh, a work in progress. Um, I think there are things that I really like talking about and that resonate with a lot of people. And I think there are uh, people who reach out to me because I talk about things like uh, the racial pay gap, the gender pay gap, um, opportunities for uh, people with uh, disabilities or who are differently abled. Um, you know, um, large part uh, discrimination is is something that I talk about a lot. So there are a few areas that I really, uh, I think, have I've kind of end up owning because um, few people in my space will actually come out and say, you know, n- not uh, how should I say it. People in our space, in this space, as far as talking about careers and job search advice, a lot of times they give advice before really acknowledging that there are problems. And it comes out as advice. Not everybody's really attracted to just hearing advice from people, uh, Mm -hmm. especially in my space. Some people want to see, do you really care? Right. So, you know, I think that's my first... uh, you know, the part of the biggest part of my agenda is, is showing that I care. And because that I care, people have reached out and have said, you know, what you said really resonate, resonate with me or um, so they do business with me for the fact that I understand and talk about what they can relate to. So, you know, those are things that uh, they truly to heart make a difference for me. Yeah, and then definitely in today's um, day and age, and I mean, probably before too, but especially now, um, it's not so much about what you know, but it's about what, uh, you know, how much you care. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's so many job career people out there, and uh, definitely showing empathy and caring it can really make a good distinction between, um, you know, you and, and, and the others. Yeah. And uh, this is a perfect lead into my next question. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you talked a lot about, you know, the racial pay gap, gender gap, disabilities, and other types of discrimination. And sometimes that leads to us believing myths about finding work or career. Mm-hmm. What are some of the job search myths, um, that you come across that we just believe are 
hundred percent true. Well, good question. Uh, the number one is probably uh, most people only look when they are without a job, which is um, you know a habit that we've gotten from the past, and you know, be, it, but it's kind of fifteen year old advice at this point. Um, being that uh, the world has changed since, you know, September 11th and all. Um, We can, uh, jobs disappeared, companies disappeared. Um, Mm -hmm. So we don't have the luxury anymore of uh, job search or job finding on demand. Um, We look for a job only when it's, (laughs) uh, only when it's demanded of us because we've lost our job. So that's a huge mistake. People are waiting uh, when they really, really need it, when really at this particular point and to really be a a modernized job seeker, your opportunities should always be open and your career should always be uh, in sort of an advancement stage. In other words, it doesn't have to be an advancement as far as job positions, but for the fact that you're always learning more, that you're adding more skills, that you're meeting people uh, to help keep you relevant in the job space and in your industry space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, as they say, it's usually easier to find a job when you already have one. Yeah, you know, when you don't have one, you know, it's it's for some reason it's just a lot tougher. Um, what's another myth? Uh, cause I know that when it comes to jobs and careers, we have all types of beliefs mm-hmm. as to how we can or can't get a job. Uh, what's another one that you come across? Um, on a regular basis, the numbers game. Um, some people will call it pray and spray, you know, that you'll, you'll spray your resume to as many as companies as you possibly can, but, uh, yielding very, little percentage of results. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people who applied to two or 300 jobs over the past seven or eight years that did not hear back from a company. Now, they may have heard from Aflac, who is always looking. Uh, UP, <laughs> UPS is always looking. And n- not to say that they're bad options, but for majority of people, that's not particularly what they're looking for, although they will say and this can also add to the job myth list if you want, uh, that uh, I am open to work anywhere. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's, uh, instead of being perceived as being, wow, you know, he could really be useful because he's able to do anything, it makes employers run <laughs> for yeah. skills. And so, you know, those three things I would think are the top ones, and there are others. Uh, but, uh, you know, the numbers game is a very dangerous game. It's an anti-productive game. Uh, and it really doesn't work. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's go on to another question. Okay. Um, again, um, this is a show today about finding work, mm-hmm. uh, about uh, advocating for that. Uh, why is it so hard for some people to find jobs and easier for others? Well, successful careerists who are always in opportunities are always uh, connected to other people who are always moving and shaking up their space. Um, you know, the best way to find and the fastest way to find job is really being connected to people uh, who will help you. And the idea of you already being in a job and you're looking and that you're maybe you're not content with where you're at, but at least you're productive you're in a productive space in your career at that particular point. But you see your friends making moves all the time. So, you know, you're keeping up with those people. Uh, you're connecting with the people they're connecting with, even mm-hmm. if it's a hello, it's great to meet you and that you've had a drink or that you share a Twitter connection and that you see their feed and that you start to see what they're tweeting from their feed and it's about their industries. So there's a lot of ways to connect those particular dots. But mostly it is a very dangerous game uh, to play if you are not connected in a way that people are 
you know, uh, um, not finding you interesting. But mm-hmm. people who are successful, successful careerists, they're connected to people. And they're always keeping in touch with their industry or maybe an industry that's related to them uh, to help them uh, find that next opportunity. It all comes down to people, doesn't it? No matter what it is, yeah. um, it's about connecting with other people. Yep, it is. Certainly is. It's the only way to to really keep a, a prize. I mean, there are other ways, uh, but it has to do with people, like being a part of your industry uh, professions association or professional groups, or being a part of those LinkedIn groups, or being a part of uh, those Twitter chats that are on Twitter very often. Or for the fact that you're getting the industry magazines in there, they have jobs already printed all the time. Or for the fact that you're reading an article from somebody who's doing really well and you connect with them on Twitter. I mean, there's a lot of ways, but it has to do with people. It doesn't have to do with the system. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Your Point of Q. I'm Anthony Quinones, and my guest today is Mark Anthony Dyson the voice of job seekers and we'll be right back thanks for listening to your point of cue and please don't be a stranger subscribe to the show at itunes.com and while you're there i'd love for you to rate the show leave a short review and share it with others it would mean a great deal to me all right we're back and so we've been talking about you know, staying ahead of the curve, looking for work while you have work and not waiting until that day comes. But for some people, it's just inevitable. You know, some of us will get laid off. Some of us will get fired. Some of us may take time off to raise our children. Um, so there are a lot of different scenarios where people have to find work. What are some tips that you have for people who are looking to find a job once they get laid off? Wow. Wow. Uh, well, hopefully you are already connected as, in, in some kind of way. But uh, most people, unfortunately, they get laid off as a surprise instead of uh, somewhat being prepared. And there's a difference between being you know, prepared while you're working and anticipating maybe six months as you hear, hear rumors that your, your job may be eliminated or that your performance isn't going well, or two weeks, in other words, you are seeing people leave the company because they're getting laid off or because they are just beginning to dissolve, or that you were ambushed and you were surprised. Um, Being ambushed and surprised is probably the worst of the three. You definitely want to avoid those kind of uh, situations, and most people end up in those kind of situations because they're having more faith in um, their employer sometimes more than they have faith in God or anything else. So uh, that's unfortunate. But mm-hmm. if you if you're in that situation, you want to do a couple of things that have nothing to do with uh, putting an application in. One is you, you should start to depress. In other words, there's some emotional baggage there because it's quite traumatic. I mean, um, I've been in places where people were losing their jobs uh, after 20 or 30 years, and they have mm. a very much an emotional attachment to the job and the security it provided and to the people that were there. And mm-hmm. when you're connected to people who are feeling like you, it's not really a great place to, to be. Um, so, uh, you want to get rid of that emotional baggage. It may take some counseling sometimes. It may take uh, that you just need to take a couple of weeks away to depress, uh, to, to deal with and reconcile with the idea that you no longer have the same job opportunity or the same job and a place to go and a check coming in. Um, once you get over that, or if you can get over that quickly, um, you, you got to start looking at what's going to be ahead. And that is, it's, it's time for you to start collecting information. How are people looking for jobs these days? How are they connecting? How are people connecting in the jobs that you're interested in? 
and to also find out uh, if there are still opportunities in your industry. Some people find out their industry has gone away as they knew it. Um, mm-hmm. They don't keep apprised of what's going on with how people are finding jobs or what's the latest technology, and they've got to learn those things. So you got to know what you need to uh, do, what you need to learn, and how to go about it before you actually do. And then you need to start doing some research. What companies are actually uh, interested in your skill set, if any at all? That's going to the best way to find out is start connecting with those people. And, you know, everybody should know about LinkedIn and having a LinkedIn profile. I'm going to assume that you at least have some kind of profile, even, even though it's static at the moment. And you're going to start uh, looking for those individuals in your contacts. Now, I've run across recently somebody who said everybody that I know is in the same position that I am and all that. Well, I guess it's time for you to get to know new people. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) Change that position. Right. So the researching, and, and when I say research, research the company and the industry, find out whatever intelligence you can find out. Um, Finding out what positions and where you would fit. Do you need to go learn some new things? Are there temporary positions possibly? Are there maybe contracting positions possibly that you can connect with while you're looking for something? Maybe temporary contracting might be something that you can do um, for a while while you look for the next job. That's the best scenario other than having a job uh, when, you, when you've when you been laid off or when you've been fired. So when you've done your research, you've done your intel, you've talked to people, don't make changes without talking to people and finding out. I mean, you, you, could, find, you could find jobs and opportunities that don't fit, and that could be just as bad. Yeah. Or you could find out jobs, it, 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 find out jobs where you're really underemployed, and sometimes the underemployment piece could really suck a whole lot more than not having a job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that and that's the truth. But you know, if you want to avoid that situation, you want to find out all the information, bring it back, and then do something that is very count- counterintuitive these days. Then that's when you want to start updating your resume. You want to start updating your LinkedIn profile. You want to start updating your Facebook page and maybe your Instagram page to reflect, to look like that you are a modern, relevant job seeker. And there are plenty of places on the web where you can find out how to do those things or how to get those accounts and and things like that. Um, the best scenario is to create a blog or a website of some type that where people can find you, yeah. uh, where recruiters can find you, employers can find you, um, and become interested in you. But you've got to put your best forward, foot forward. So there's plenty of places, including the Voice of Job Seekers, to, to find go. some information uh, about how to do those things. So... Um, after you've done that, uh, another important piece is for you then to connect with people that can help you build a pathway to those opportunities. So in a nutshell, and there's so much more prob- probably can say about that, um, yeah. that you should do. That formula is not going to look the same to everybody, but um, it is very important that first piece is is right on that you deal with the baggage so that you're not carrying it around to other employers and people you network with because nothing worse uh, for most people is to help somebody who's whining, complaining, dealing with emotional stuff, and uh, instead of finding out intelligence that's going to help you thrive. Yeah, because I I think a a lot of times people walk around like jilted lovers when they're looking for work. Yeah. And and they don't realize is that when you're hurt, you tend to inflict that hurt on the next person. Yes. And and we don't see that, but pretty much everybody else does. And so uh, what you said about depressing and really looking within is very important because, you know, know, as they say, you don't want to jump out of the frying 
frying pan into the fire mm-hmm. and just do something else that's you know just as bad or even worse. Yeah. And and then all the other things you mentioned about the research and the intel, you know, just doing your homework. And then talking to people, it all comes back to people. No matter what era we're in, it always comes back to connecting with people, not so much systems. I mean, systems are important, but it's really more about people than anything else. Yeah, yeah. you definitely want your connections and, and what you learn from people to be a major catalyst for what you find next. Mm-hmm. So we talked about getting laid off, and most people are not ashamed to say they've been laid off because, in a sense, you're fired, but it's not your fault. It's the company's fault. You know, they may have laid you off because of technology, merger, declining revenue, et cetera. But how about people who have gotten fired or, let's say, people who have left the job force voluntarily to raise their children for three, four, five years, and now they want to get back in? How do you help people to explain those two things? Good question. Gosh, okay. Well, you know, most people, <laughs> you know, if you've been doing things that are noble, like taking care of older parents uh, and they may have passed away or that you've added, been adding to your, um, uh, to your family, uh, there are things that you've probably done outside of that, too. You probably have volunteered, whether it's been with your PTA board or mm-hmm. that you've done it in the neighborhood or, or, or that maybe you've even advocated for um, uh, somebody that was running for office. Uh, or And there's a lot of different situations. Or you may have been learning a hobby and maybe you perfected it. There are skills from those uh, actual uh, activities that you have honed to a certain degree, you may not have noticed. So that you've been, you can be able to use part of that as your personal marketing to show that you've been active and these are some skills that you can use today to help make a company more profitable, more knowledgeable, uh, you know, help train their employees or to even be a productive member of that particular company. Uh, people often think of their careers in vacuums, and which isn't uh, particularly the case. I mean, it can end up in a vacuum if you allow it. Or you could, you've taken the skills that you've learned elsewhere, and you've applied them, and these are the common skills that you have. So you can use that to help leverage to uh, at least maybe even get your foot in the door to volunteer somewhere where you'd be interested to work or that you'd be able to get a part-time or a temporary job that way. But if people look and, and just have more of a, a, an intrinsic investigation about their career, uh, they would be able to find those things and be able to uh, not just put them on the resume, but the whole idea that you now can uh, plug it in into another place to uh, to be a productive member of that team. Mm. So it sounds like you're saying that your job, that your skills outside of work are sometimes just as important as the skills you have at your career. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it is um, you'd be surprised what our hobbies can even bring. Um, yeah. y- you know, totally agree with that. <laughs> um, there are, there's a story of, uh, of a young boy and we probably heard about it and I can't think of his name, uh, because he's a well-known name now. He used to play dice on the streets and, you know, I'm from Harlem. They, you know, originally. All right. <laughs> and in in the late sixties, early seventies, dice was the game. It's not yes, the, it was. In some parts of urban America, dice is still the game. But mm-hmm. because he had he didn't realize that because of the way that numbers are formulated, he had built some kind of automatic system in his brain. So when he ended up going to uh to employers later on. Uh, he took a test, and that test showed that he his math, mathematical IQ was off the charts. Now, mm. his reading wasn't all that great, but what they decided was is that they can use his ability to assess numbers 
and to and to calculate very quickly and make that a useful part. And I forgot what he did, but I'm just saying though those little games that we used to play as kids, those hobbies that we had, even if it's trading baseball cards, yep. you, you can find some some things. Uh, uh, some skills there, especially ones that are are uh, that deal with uh, artificial and emotional intelligence uh, out of it that you can apply to a job. You just got to be able to find those things, and there's a lot of ways you could do it. There's the Mari Briggs. Uh, there's all types of tests online that you could take just to get you started uh, if you're in that place. But m- most people don't dig that deep, and that's. One of the reasons for myself and a show like yours is to show people the possibilities so that they can find something that resonates with them and apply it to their lives. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm from the Bronx, uh, so we have a connection there. Absolutely. And uh, obviously, we see a lot of bad stuff living in the inner city. Sure. But there are a lot of skills that people use for the bad that end up being for the good in, in itself. Like, obviously, something like drug dealing is not a good thing. Uh, but it is a form of entrepreneurship. <laughs> well, it's a form and, of and, entrepreneurship, but there's also negotiating skills that are yeah. You know, people don't really you say, well, yeah, that's a bad thing. But the skill part is what you try to extract from that and, and yeah. make that something that's employable. Yeah, you take the skill, you take the good out of the skill and use it for the right thing, hopefully uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I mean, we could talk for a long, a lot longer on this. Sure. Uh, definitely appreciate all that you've shared. Um, definitely um, love to talk some more at some other point. Okay. Um, but uh, while we finish up here, why don't you let our audience know where they can find out more about you and what you do? Uh, the Voice of Job Seekers dot com, and you have to have the Voice of Job Seekers plural dot com. Uh, if you leave out the S or leave out the um, he, he won't find me. Although you can also go hit me up on Twitter at Mark A Dyson D Y S O N, and uh, I'll be glad to interact with you, answer any questions you have. Okay. Well, again, I appreciate it, Mark. Uh, thank you for being a guest on your point of cue. Great. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs>